Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary Baptist Church in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Our focus on the book of Galatians continues with a message today about peace. We are looking at Galatians chapter 5. You can download the Life Notes now from our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Pete Bunnell. Go ahead and have a seat. It's great to be with you today. Um, I am Pastor Pete. I'm the Life Group Pastor. Um, As you heard me say in the prayer, uh, the Zambia team is doing fine and doing ministry, and Pastor Chad is there with them leading that team as they go about doing their work. I want to invite you to grab a Bible. You can get the Bible or the Bible app if you need a Bible. There's one in the seat in front of you. Um, Also out to the Parker team, of course, your Bible is now in the seat in front of you. I had the blessing of being with the Parker campus. You guys have a beautiful campus. Pastor Ruben and the team are doing a great job, and I just appreciate you welcoming my family last week. Um, For our online community, if you need a Bible, message your host, because uh, we want you to have a Bible so you can read it and let it change your life. If you're here and you need a Bible or in Parker and need a Bible, take that Bible with you. It is our gift to you. We want it to be something that is a part of your life that you're reading and bringing into your heart and letting God work on you through his word. So we are in the book of Galatians. We are studying the fruit of the spirit. If you're looking for that in that Bible here in the room, it's on page 1150. Yeah, it's 1158. And uh, when we started the sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit, uh, we were challenged to see if we could memorize Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So today is your pop quiz. All right, let's see how we're doing on it. The fruit of the Spirit is, join me, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. Okay, good job. You guys did good. Um, you know, it's hard to get those, uh, those words all in order, right? But you did a nice job. So the fruit of the Spirit. And as we've been studying the fruit of the Spirit, uh, we've asked questions like, would you like to have more love in your life? And everyone raises their hand, right? Last week it was, would you like to have more joy in your life? And everyone raise their hands. Today's question is, would you like to have more peace in your life? Yes. yes. Yeah. We, we want these things, right? Because they're good. Like we can look at them and we can say, ah, this is good. I want this in my life. So the fruit of the spirit, when we come to the third fruit, peace, we're dealing with a topic that the Bible speaks a lot about. It's actually in the Bible over 380 times, either the word peace or peacefulness. It's a, it's a big topic. And in the Bible, when they're talking about peace, they're kind of talking about a state of well-being that's characterized by prosperity, by wholeness, by a lack of conflict, a lack of hostility. A lot of times peace is described as a loving and loyal relationship with God and with others. So peace is definitely something that we want, but we sometimes have a really hard time attaining it, don't we? And the reason we have that struggle, I think, is because peace is plundered by the world. It's point number one. Peace is plundered by the world. What do I mean by that? I mean that the world and the world systems are set up against your peace. Sometimes that even happens in the church. If you remember, as we've been going through the book of Galatians, there's been some things going on in that church where they were not experiencing very much peace. If you look back just a page to uh, Galatians 5, 15, there's that warning. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you do not consume one another. So even at church, we can have this critical spirit, this place where there's gossip and people are picking at each other and destroying one another. That doesn't sound very peaceful. Or how about the works of the flesh? Just a few verses up in Galatians 5, uh, 21 and 20. The works of the flesh are described as fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. I mean, these are all things that describe the opposite of peace, don't they? And that's just coming from within ourselves. It's what our deeds naturally want to do. 
And then of course there's religious rules. As we've been studying the book of Galatians, we have seen that religious rules, this, ex this expectation that we perform or that we achieve perfection by following religious rules eats at our peace. It destroys our peace. And you, I mean, if you, have you thought about it very much about the religious rule that was taking root in this church? It was that the guys had to get circumcised. I mean, talk about ruining your church service. <laughs> step, by, step up to the foyer and schedule your circumcision for this week. You know, I mean, I'm just looking at this and I'm like thinking, man, the Galatians would have been a church without very much peace. It would have been a place that you would have been like, oh, one time was enough, I'm not going back. <laughs> Charles Stanley suggests three different mindsets that destroy our peace. Um, one is past regrets. You know what those are. Those things that we've done or we've said that we wish we could take back, but we just can't. So those things, they eat at us and they destroy our peace. The other is present concerns. You know, we're all going through different storms in life. We have relational struggles. We have financial problems. We have health issues. And these are all these present things that we're going through right now and they eat at our peace and they make it hard for us to feel like we're at a state of well-being. And then of course there's future fears. Those future things that when we think about tomorrow, we're like, ah, I'm nervous, I'm anxious, I'm worried. It's when we play the what if game, right? Since it's politics season, we go, what if the other guy wins? And we're anxious and we're worried. We think, what if the doctor says that it's cancer? And we're anxious. What if my spouse dies? What if I lose my job? And then of course, there is that great fear, what if I die? And all of these things begin to cause us anxiety and fear and worry. And then it's all made worse by the fact that we're sinners. Our, our sinfulness just magnifies this lack of peace. It has created, our sinfulness has created so much hostility between us and God and us and others and within our own hearts that we basically are helpless to achieve peace on our own. But the good news is, is that God did not leave us in that state of lacking peace. So he sent Christ and our peace was purchased by Jesus. Our peace was purchased by Jesus, point number two. This is really good news. So Isaiah, calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. Before Jesus ever walked the earth, he said that this coming Messiah would be the Prince of Peace. And then when Jesus was born, what did the angels proclaim? Peace on earth, right? Peace on earth. So, so Jesus comes on the scene as the Prince of Peace, this child that's gonna grow and is going to bring peace on earth. How did he do that? I think we find an answer in Ephesians 2. If you've got your Bible open to Galatians, just flip over one page and you'll probably be on Ephesians 2. And we have Paul again explaining how Jesus purchased our peace. Starting in verse 13, Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So Jesus purchased our peace and without Jesus, we don't have any peace. 
We don't have any true peace, I should say. And you're reading that, you might be listening to it and going, you know, I don't feel like I'm far away from God. If you're not in Jesus, this tells me that you are far away from God. Maybe you're thinking, I don't have hostility towards God. But if you're not in Jesus, there is hostility between you and God. There is not peace between you and God. And if you're not in Jesus, there can't really be peace between you and me either. So what Jesus did is he came to this world that had no peace and he purchased peace for us through his blood. Through Christ's blood, through his broken body, he offers us forgiveness. He offers to break down this wall of hostility that keeps us from having peace with God. He brings us all together in this relationship with God. And because he does that, he breaks down the wall of hostility that's between us as people. This forgiveness was purchased with his own life. That's how important it was for us to be able to experience peace. It was so important for us to be able to have a right relationship with God, for the hostility to be killed, like it said here, that Jesus died for us and he rose again. So if you're here today and you don't know for sure that your relationship with God is one of peace, if you don't know for sure that there's no hostility between you and God, if you don't know for sure that your relationship with God is marked by peace, let me encourage you to trust in Christ today. Trust in the Prince of Peace. Trust in the person who preached peace to those who were far off and those who were near because he did everything you need to have peace with God. You just have to trust. You just have to believe. And if you make that decision today for the first time, I hope that you will come up and talk to one of the pastors. Come and talk to the prayer team. If you're in Parker, you can talk to the prayer team up front at the end of the service. If you're online, send Christian a message. Let him know that you're accepting Christ because we want to pray with you and we want to celebrate that commitment. So how does Jesus go about destroying the things that destroy our peace? Let's think about that for a minute. So I talked about past regrets, right? Those things that we've done that we wish we hadn't done. Those things that when they come back into our mind, we think, man, how can God even love me? Or how can God even use me? Because we regret those things. The good news is, is that when Christ died for us and he paid for our peace, he gives us a bunch of promises that sin that we regret, God has removed from us as far as the east is from the west. That sin that we wish we hadn't done, Christ has thrown that into the bottom of the sea. This beautiful promise that all of those sins that we wish could be a part, not a part of our past, that we could never remember them again, Jesus promises that he remembers them no more. So if Jesus was willing to do that, if he was willing to suffer and die for us and he was willing to remove that sin from his own mind, we need to do the same thing. When those regrets start to plague us and start to say, man, I can't serve, I can't do that, I can't follow God anymore, and you, you're weighed down by the regret, remember, Jesus died for that and he doesn't remember it anymore. And he's cast that thing that you wish you hadn't done. He's cast it into the deepest ocean. He's removed it from you. And that is really good news. How about our present concerns? How about those things that right now, if you're thinking, do I have peace? And you think about all those things that are going on in your mind and in your life that feel like they're stealing your peace. When I think about this, I think about Jesus on the boat with his disciples. After a long day of ministry, they're at, it's at night and they're going across the Sea of Galilee and uh, there, become, there comes a storm. Strong winds, big waves, battering the boat that they're in. And the disciples are terrified and they're afraid they're gonna die. And what is Jesus doing? He's taking a nap. He is sleeping in the boat. 
Now, that's either a testament to how exhausted he was, which I'm sure he was exhausted, but there's also a fact that he must have had so much internal peace that he could sleep in the middle of that storm when everyone else thought they were going to die. And they wake him up and they say, don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus just stands up and says, peace, be still. And the wind stops and the wave stops. That's our savior, guys. That's our savior. So what is the storm that you're going through? What is it? Is it a marriage that's falling apart? Is it a diagnosis that's gonna change your life forever? Is it this financial crisis that you don't know where the money is coming for, from, for, for tomorrow? Whatever that storm is that you're walking through, the good news is, is that your savior is the one who calms the storm, okay? So that's really good news. So that means that if he wants to, that trial you're going through can be wiped out. You just have to ask and trust. But the reality is also that he might decide it's better for you to go through that storm. He might decide that it's better for you to endure and to learn peace while you walk through that storm. And here's the good news. He's walking with you. He's with you through that. So whatever your present con condition is, whatever presently is stealing your peace, you have a savior who can calm that storm and it can, who can help you stand up under that pressure. And then of course, there's your future fears. Your future fears, the things that you think about in the future that are just weighing you down. And to that, I think of Christ on the cross next to a thief who is dying. A thief who has gone through the most agonizing torture that he'd ever experienced. He's experiencing the most shame that he could ever experience. And somehow in that moment, he gets this glimpse of saying, remember me when you go into your kingdom. He somehow has the presence of mind to say, Jesus, I need to be with you in heaven. Remember me. And Jesus offers the most peace promising words he could. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. That changes everything. That changes everything. No matter what that thief goes through for the next several hours while he dies on that cross, there is a hope for the future. There is a hope that, you know, this is gonna be bad, but what's coming is gonna be so much better. If we can put that final fear, that great fear of death, if we can put that to rest, we don't really have to worry about anything else. We can walk through the cancer diagnosis knowing that in the end, Christ gets us and we won't have cancer anymore. We can walk through this relationship that's broken and we can say, you know, maybe my spouse doesn't want me anymore, but Jesus does. And he's gonna take me to be in, to, in heaven with him forever. We can walk through any struggle, any difficulty with this future hope that everything will be made right for eternity in heaven. So Jesus takes care of our past. He takes care of our present. He takes care of our future. And when we come to him, he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit. In uh, John 14, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey, I'm going away, but I'm gonna send a helper. I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. And then right after he says that, he says, I'm going to leave you with my peace. So the Spirit, getting the Holy Spirit is getting Christ's peace. So when we come to Christ, not only does he take care of all of those things, he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us his peace. And that is a promise. And that spirit that we have is the one who is producing the fruit of the spirit in us. The spirit is producing 
peace in our life. And while the Spirit is producing peace in our life, we have a responsibility. Peace is to be pursued by us. Peace is pursued by us. That's point number three. So we've heard the term required coursework, right? Right, that the fruit of the Spirit is required coursework. Every Christian needs to have the fruit of the Spirit developing in their life. Peace is one of those items. I kind of liken it to getting that bike when you were a kid, okay? You have a birthday, your parents give you a bike, it's a cool bike, it's a new bike, and um, you ride it once and then you put it away and then you go back to watching TV or you go back to the screen time, right? And that nice new bike is just sitting there, but the screen is so much easier, right? The screen is way easier. And so then your parents say, hey, you should go out and ride your bike. That would be way better for you than sitting on the couch watching TV. That would be way better than staring at your screen. You have a gift, but you have to choose to use it. You have to exercise it. The Holy Spirit has given us this ability to have peace, but we're also commanded to pursue it. Look at uh, 2 Peter, or I'm sorry, 1 Peter 3, verse 10. 1 Peter 3, 10 says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, that sounds good to me, right? I want to love my life. I want to see good days. Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. If we want to have good life, if we want to see good days, let us seek peace and pursue it. Romans 14, 19 says about the same thing. We are to pursue peace. It is our responsibility to do that. So tonight I want to just give you a couple of ways that you can pursue peace. Number one, you can remember that the Father will give you everything you need. Remember that the Heavenly Father will give you everything you need. In Matthew 6, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount and he's talking to people who are all worried about the future, what they're gonna eat, what they're gonna wear. And Jesus says, hey, look at the lilies of the field. They're clothed, they look great. And think about the birds in the air. They don't worry about what they're gonna eat. God is clothing the flowers. God is giving food to the birds. Don't you think you're more valuable than all of these things? I will take care of you. The Father will take care of you. He'll give you the things that you need. So if we're gonna pursue peace, one of the things we have to do is we have to remember that God's gonna provide what we need. He provided Jesus Christ. He provided forgiveness. How will he not also give us all things that we need? He will. We need to remember that. Next, we have to pray when we're anxious. We need to pray when we're anxious. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so there's this command, don't be anxious. Like, okay, that's easier said than done. Don't be anxious, don't worry. What am I supposed to do in set, instead? Well, in everything we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray in everything that would cause that anxiety. And he says, with thanksgiving. Isn't that odd? You're like, I'm worried and you want me to be thankful? Yes, God wants you to be thankful. Thankful that you can bring that request to him. Thankful that he is the God who can meet that need. So we pray and it says the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that nice? When our mind is spiraling out of control in worry and anxiety, God promises that when we pray with thanksgiving that he's gonna guard our minds. He's gonna put this protective layer around us. How does he do that? Well, I think one way he does it is by answering those prayers, by, by meeting us in that need, in that anxiety. But also he does it by letting us know that he's gonna walk with us. He's gonna be there with us. He's gonna help us 
to achieve peace. And he's going to help us to go through this challenge. So we remember, we pray, and then we have to take care of conflict. Take care of conflict. So let's just be honest. How many of you have some conflict in your life? Yep. Everyone has conflict because we're around other people, right? We're around other people. So we have conflict. We have to take care of that conflict. So um, we were invited earlier today to get a Right Now Media account. Okay, there's a Bible study that I want to just recommend to you that's on Right Now Media. It's called Resolving Everyday Conflict. Okay, Resolving Everyday Conflict. And what you're going to find when you go into that Bible study, so it's an eight-week study, eight-session study, but what you're going to find is four helpful tips. When you're dealing with conflict, first you have to remember that this is a chance to glorify God. Whatever this unpleasant fight that you're going through is, it is your chance to glorify God because you can enter into it and please him in the midst of it. Then it's going to explain to you how to get real about your own part in that conflict. It's taking the log out of your own eye. We have to do that if we're going to solve a conflict. We have to say, what did I do? How did I contribute to this? And we need to take our own responsibility. Then it's going to help you think through how you can gently engage with the other person to help them to see where this conflict has come from and how it might be resolved. So it's going to help you to gently engage with the person you're in a fight with. And then it's going to help you get together on some lasting solutions. We have to take care of conflict. If we want to pursue peace, Romans 12, 18 says, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So as much as it depends on you, you've got to pursue peace with people. That will be a resource that will help you do that. And then finally, we have to set our mind on the Spirit. Romans 8 says that if we set our mind on the Spirit, then our mind is set on life and peace. In Galatians 5, it says, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. So as we set our mind on God's Word, as we set our mind on the Spirit and all that the Spirit can do for us, we are going to get peace. We're going to get peace. So we have to be pursuing peace so today, as I wrap up, let me just ask this. Can you identify some way that the world is plundering your peace? Is there something that's habitually happening in your life that is stealing your peace that you could have? Would you make a decision today to bring that to the Lord, to trust Jesus in the midst of that? whether that's a problem with another person, whether that's a problem internally, whether that's a problem externally, whatever it is, would you say, I'm going to bring that to the Lord and I want to have his peace in my life there? And then once you trust Jesus, because he paid the price so you could have peace, once you trust him, would you follow the path of peace that he has marked out? Trust him in the midst of that past regret bring your present concerns to him. Keep in mind that your future is secure in him. And then decide how you will pursue peace this week. How will you go after peace and make it a part of your life? I already mentioned the Resolving Everyday Conflict on Right Now Media. That's a great resource. It's free to all of you. Please take advantage of it. Another free resource that I'm going to recommend is that you get that Bible app on your phone and you go and you look up a devotional called Finding Peace by Charles Stanley. It's a seven-day devotional. It's going to lead you through some steps so you can begin to pursue peace more wholeheartedly in the coming week. Calvary, I hope that today marks a day that's going to change some of the anxiety and worry in your life, and you're going to be able to experience greater peace because of all that Jesus has done for you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, right now, we just offer to you our anxiety and our worry. Those things that are going to keep us up this week or have been keeping us up last week, 
that we've been thinking about, we just cast them on you. We can cast all of our cares on you because you care for us, because your shoulders are infinitely broad and you can carry those weights. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he paved a way for us to know you, to experience peace with you, to have that hostility between us and God the Father erased, to break down that wall of separation and to offer us peace because we're forgiven, because we have that future hope of heaven, because our past sins are covered and taken care of and you remember them no more. Lord, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our mission at Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. One of the things that's repeated often here is that if you read and apply God's word, he will change your life. If you are aware that things are not right and suspect that you need a change in your life, I encourage you to open your Bible and read. If you don't have a Bible and want one, you can email us at questions at calvaryaz.com. We'll be happy to mail you a Bible, connect with, and pray with you. Well, that's all for today. Have a great week and come back next week when we'll be learning about patience. Take care. Bye-bye.